It's Wednesday, December 21st, and he's about to be audited by everyone. We start here. After years of court battles, a congressional committee votes to make former President Trump's tax returns public. We're talking about tax reports. We're talking about tax returns. We're talking about January 6th reports. This is going to happen in the next couple days. We'll get you up to speed. Women's worst fears are coming true in Afghanistan. We live in a big prison with very restrict rooms. The Taliban is now banning women from universities. And her word was her bond, but that wasn't good enough for the courts. There are so many women that I met in jail that was in there just like me. Now, Illinois will see what happens when there's no such thing as bail money. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. For more than seven years now, we've been told the same thing. It was said by Donald Trump, then President Trump, then former President Trump. The message has always been this. I'm a really great businessman, I'm incredibly wealthy, and I'm incredibly generous. However, unlike any other president in modern history, I'm not going to show you the tax returns that would verify any of this. We're under audit, uh, despite what uh, people said, and we're... uh working that out as I'm always under audit, it seems, but I've been under audit for many years because Trump always spoke of an audit, which was weird since being under audit doesn't actually prevent you from showing people your tax returns. And once again, Donald Trump is running for president. Once again, he seems to have no intention of furnishing those tax returns, but Democrats still control both chambers of Congress for a little over a week. And recently, after years of court battles, Democrats got their hands on Trump's tax returns. There being 20 24 eyes and 16 no's. The motion to submit the committee report to the House is agreed to, and the documents are ordered reported to the House. Last night, they decided to make them public. Let's go to the Capitol right now. ABC's Will Staken covers the House. ABC's Catherine Falders is our investigative reporter covering all the investigations and the former president. Will, let me ask you first. So these tax returns of President Trump, we've been asking about them for years. They're coming out? Like this is real? <laughs> Yeah, so that we're going to see a few years of these tax returns from former President Trump. Um, last night, the House Ways and Means Committee voted uh, to have these returns that they have released over the next, you know, few days. We're apparently not going to be seeing them right away. It's going to take a couple of days to redact stuff like Social Security names, other information that they want out. But, you know, this is something that, like you said, President Trump has fought to keep these returns private, breaking precedent from, you know, d- decades of other presidents. And now we're going to see them in the next next few days. And just so I'm clear, hey, Catherine Falders, what is the rationale for this decision? Because like, I get why reporters wanted access to these returns. Helps us understand the guy's record, helps us evaluate his claims. But what, like, why do members of Congress think it's necessary to publish the president's tax returns? Yeah, so uh, this all started because Neil, uh, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, requested this tax data. Uh, but the legislative purpose, if you will, that he's talked about uh, was because he wanted to look into this mandatory audit program that the IRS has to conduct these mandatory audits while a president or vice president uh, is in office. Now, that's what he was looking for through all of this data. But what was interesting in, in this, and we've heard Trump say, I've been under audit, I'm under audit, I can't release my taxes. He said this while he was campaigning. He said this while he was president. Now, what the chairman of the committee is saying is that there was no record of those audits occurring while Trump was president until Neil actually requested this data himself, which he made his first request in April of 2019. And once staff had a chance uh, to go to some of the other locations that are within the jurisdiction of the IRS, they quickly concluded that, in fact, the audit did did not occur. Then Neil says there was a record uh, of Trump being notified that there was an audit going on, but that was only after the committee started looking into them. And specifically, Catherine, it sounds like, like, I didn't know this until recently, like, there's a system where you're supposed to, the IRS specifically audits current presidents, right? So they weren't looking, like, back at, like, 1980s Trump. They were looking at, like, when Trump's campaigning and then becoming president. Yeah, that's right. They only audit current presidents when they file their returns. And Neil requested these returns. And and by the way, all this tax data for uh, some of Trump's businesses, too. uh, But the returns specifically for the years 2015 through 2020. And that's the 
the information that he's talking about here, how these didn't appear to be ongoing or, or the process wasn't really working internally in some areas. It seems like it was unclear, Brad, if there was like a mandatory audit, if there was just an assessment of the taxes. Uh, but but yeah, that's right. Well, and so, guys, I feel like the next couple of days are going to be all about Trump's taxes. Well, first, I guess, later this morning, you got the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, on the Hill. That's going to be a big deal. But then it's all about Trump's taxes. But, Will, like, should Democrats maybe not gloat too much here? Because, like, in 10 days or whatever, they're not the ones deciding who gets investigated anymore, whose taxes could get revealed anymore, right? Right. And, and Republicans have made it more than clear that they plan to hit the ground running with investigations in the new year. I mean, they've already started. We're not trying to prove Hunter Biden is a bad actor. He is. If anybody wants to disagree with that, then there's nothing we have to talk about. Our investigation is about Joe Biden. The day after clinching the House, Republicans held a press conference laying out how they were going to investigate, you know, use this new subpoena power to investigate Hunter Biden, Joe Biden. Um, you know, committee chairmen Comer and Jordan has told Catherine and I that they're looking to lay out investigations into everything from COVID origins to the Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, we're just going to see a like a litany of investigations. And last week, Comer told me in, in the House that we should expect an oversight hearing every single week once he gets things up and running. So it's going to be, you know, it's going to be an intense next year for Republican investigations. But Brad, it actually doesn't even end there because in 11 days, the January 6th committee, I know we've been talking about them a lot, the, that committee expires. So they're still calling out their Republican colleagues, but they still have to release their final report. It's going to be hundreds of pages. That's expected to come uh, later on today. I know they had a hearing earlier this week. We saw an executive summary, but they have hundreds of pages that have been with the government printing office here in D.C., <laughs> that they're going to release as well. Wait, so each side, like basically anyone in the House right now, like this is ammo time for Democrats over the next few days and Republicans getting their ammo ready for early January. That's what you guys are saying. I mean, think about how much you're seeing. I mean, we keep talking about all these reports. We're talking about tax reports. We're talking about tax returns. We're talking about January 6th reports, criminal referrals. Democrats need to wrap up their work. They're not going to be able to do this in the new Congress. So they're hitting the ground running for these last not even two weeks to try and wrap up all of this business before this Congress expires. All right. Uh, Catherine Falders there, uh, Will Staken, covering the House. Thank you both so much. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Brad. America's longest war is drawing to a close, but as U.S. troops head home, the Taliban is advancing across Afghanistan. Everyone seemed to understand the risks of the Taliban taking over Afghanistan once again. The concern was, of course, that again, the country would become a theocracy, where not practicing an extreme form of Islam would be considered a crime. Women had spent the last two decades carving out a new place in their nation. Everyone now was worried the Taliban would decimate that progress. When Americans uh, leave our country, uh, we think that uh, we will face an inner war and it will drop our education. All girls want to live in peace. To which the incoming government said, no, nah, you got us all wrong. We want Afghan women educated. Well, yesterday, with American troops long gone, that promise was officially rolled back. Afghan leaders have announced women are no longer welcome at universities. ABC Shannon Crawford covers the State Department. Shannon, what is the rule now in Afghanistan? Like, just no women at colleges? Well, basically, women have been completely shut out of the education system. Women were previously allowed to attend universities, but in a limited sense, they were in gender segregated classes. There were certain subjects that were deemed inappropriate for women, so they'd have to pick a different course of study. But now they are completely out of the education system. There is no way to obtain a college degree or even really step into a classroom for so many women across Afghanistan now. What was the reason for the change? And because for a while they were basically saying, like, as long as you obey our version of Sharia law, then you're fine. Right. So so why now? So when the Taliban came back into power, Brad, they basically promised to be kinder, softer versions of the Taliban that everyone knew. They promised to be more enlightened and allow women to still enjoy some of their hard fought rights. And one thing we've seen in the 15 or so months since the pre-existing government fell is that the Taliban really did not intend to keep their word on that. 
This is the shared room of my sister and me. We sleep here and study here, and this is where we are now as we cannot leave home. Now, this is a group, Brad. They believe in the strictest version of Sharia law. I had so many dreams to learn so many things at school. But the Taliban came, and it is no longer possible. And that strict interpretation does not allow space for women in the education system. And past that, the Taliban have also restricted women from engaging in most employment. They've ordered them to wear head-to-toe clothing in public. And they've also been banned from parks and gyms. So the world is growing smaller and smaller for the women of Afghanistan. We live in a big prison with very restrict rooms. What's the response from the U.S. government, from the State Department? The State Department, of course, is outraged by this development. The Taliban made promises to the people of Afghanistan and to the international community that schools would reopen. Now, we hear the opposite. They have been crying foul the whole time. We reminded the Taliban that their uh, actions, their behavior towards their own people uh, will define our relationship with them. They've come out and said there's going to be consequences, there's going to be repercussion. This is not what the Taliban should be doing if they hope to win the respect of the international community. You know what, so far, Brad, not one single country recognizes the Taliban as legitimate rulers of Afghanistan. Mm. But I think it's becoming increasingly clear and perhaps increasingly a concern for people at the State Department, other American officials, that the Taliban don't care about being recognized. What they care about is implementing their own very draconian policies. At any cost. I was going to say for a while, Shannon, it was kind of like the U.S. State Department was saying, hey, maybe they'll play ball because they want all this extra you know, aid money. They want all this extra recognition. If that concern is no longer an issue, I guess I'm wondering what the next several months or years hold, both for the women of Afghanistan and for the entire country going forward. It's a very difficult question because there's not a clear route to accountability. We saw the State Department promise that there would be repercussions for this. But they've yet to outline any clear course of action. And you know, one of the things is that aid dollars are flowing to the country. Of course, there's the option to, to stymie that money, to hold it back. But Afghanistan is also experiencing a terrible humanitarian crisis. A staggering 95% of households face food insecurity, with Afghan children starving to death nearly every single day. There's very few tools in the toolbox that the U.S. or other Western governments might use to push the Taliban towards allowing women to enjoy some rights while also not exacerbating an already drastic hunger crisis that's ravaging the country. What's clear now in 15 months of Taliban rule, Brad, Afghan women have gone back three decades, basically to the 90s when the Taliban were at the height of both their cruelty and their power. And the work that so many girls and women have done in Afghanistan is virtually erased. And Brad, something that's especially poignant, especially kind of tragic here is that even though Afghan girls have been shut out of schools, some have struggled and managed to actually take their high school graduation exams. Those took place just weeks ago. And now their dream of attending college, attending university, that's been deferred indefinitely. Mm, like they were all ready to take that next step and that next step no longer exists. All right. Uh, Shannon Crawford, keep an eye on the State Department. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Brad. One of the biggest debates of the midterm campaigns was about criminal justice reform. Not just who should be arrested for what, what crime rate is acceptable, but also when someone's arrested, what do you do with them? In any episode of Law & Order, it's a really simple bit of procedure. Someone gets arrested, they get charged, and a judge sets bail. It's so routine, it's easy to forget about. But think about what cash bail is for a second. It's a deposit that you give to the government to await your trial anywhere but in a jail cell. Well, that concept, which is so normal on cop shows, is actually drawing more and more criticism. And starting January 1st in Illinois, that will be a thing of the past. ABC's Devin Dwyer went to Illinois to ask not just how this new system's going to work, but how it will interact with current crime rates. Devin, first of all, 
we've already started seeing this in some other states, right? Ending cash bail. What is new about Illinois' approach here? A lot of states for years, Brad, have talked about uh, reforming their bail system, discontinuing the practice of asking for cash up front as collateral to let someone out awaiting trial. Uh, But Illinois is going further. This is an experiment no state has undertaken, uh, and that is to eliminate entirely the practice of cash bail uh, for all sorts of crimes at every level of the state judicial system. It was signed into law about a year ago by uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker. A transformative step forward in Illinois' effort to lead the country in dismantling systemic racism. It's going to take effect in January, and it has been dominating headlines and debate across Illinois throughout the campaign. Anti-public safety measures like no cash bail are why violent criminals roam free and why no one is safe. The Safety Act is designed to keep murderers and domestic abusers, uh, violent criminals in jail. But the people have spoken, legislators are moving forward, and this will take effect uh, on the 1st. And it, and it means, at the bottom line, Brad, that a lot fewer people will be held in detention, having been arrested, having been charged with crimes while they await trial. Yeah, can you just like walk me through the rationale for this kind of experiment? Because I know that a lot of these cases, you know, disproportionately affect black and brown communities. I know they obviously disproportionately affect poor folks. But like, what is the kind of view from criminal justice reform circles on on why this is the way to go? Well, advocates, Brad, say this practice has gotten out of hand and been abused. It, it, you know, since 1970, it looked at the numbers. 433% increase in the number of people held in our jails on low-level offenses. Most of them are disproportionately uh, people of color. This is data from the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Um, and most of the defendants, 60% of defendants in this country, that's half a million people on any given day, are eligible for release but they're kept in jail simply because they can't pay the bill. Some of them um, are, are there for a few days, weeks, months, but there are cases of people being held over a year. I assume you thought you'd be there maybe a day. Yeah, I thought maybe a day. I figured that I wouldn't be there that long, not away from my kids. I met one of these women in Chicago, Lavette Mays. Uh, She's a 52-year-old mother of two, grew up on the south side of Chicago. She was the owner of a small school transportation uh, van company where she took kids to school every day. Never been to jail a day in my life. I only went over to jury duty, and that was it. You've never been in trouble? I've never been in trouble. In 2015, she was involved in a messy divorce of, with her husband, 23 years, and she got into a, an altercation uh, with her mother-in-law. It landed both of them in the hospital, and she was arrested for that altercation that was had, landed in the Cook County Jail. They hit the gavel and said that my bond was assessed at 250000 25000 to walk. And she couldn't afford time. it. And she ended up spending uh, more than 571 days in custody, Brad, um, uh, over a year. Wow. Um, until she was able to, she took a plea deal ultimately and moved on with her life. Wait, why so, why so long before even a trial, Devin? That seems like part of the issue as well, perhaps. A- absolutely. And, and it's because of the backlog in the system uh, in Illinois, because of negotiations with, um, with, with uh, the counsel on both sides in this particular case. But she talks very poignantly about how it effectively destroyed her life. The amount of things and the trauma that you go through when you are locking up, uh, especially a woman, and you have a business, you're not able to tend to that business. You're not able to continue. I almost lost custody of my kids. And that's exactly what advocates say is counterproductive. They say not letting some of these lower level offenders, and they may be offenders, guilty as charged, but not allowing them the opportunity to keep their lives, their uh, livelihoods, their homes going actually contributes uh, to greater um, you know, crime in these communities and instability in these communities. Uh, and that argument seems to have won the day. Wow. So I, then I totally understand why someone might think the system's out of control. But Devin, like for the larger community, isn't the idea that bail keeps us all safer? Like that's how we're able to differentiate the little crimes from the big crimes, right? Like if the crime's worse or the person's riskier, you give them the higher bail amount that they would lose if they acted up. I guess I'm wondering, like, what happens if that whole incentive system just goes away? Well, that incentive system, uh, advocates say, is completely 
um, out of whack because you have uh, members of gangs, for example, on gun charges, post a very high bail, they can find the money right. through their networks and they pay and get out. I feel that it was unjust, it was unfair because there are so many women that I met in jail that was in there just like me. Meanwhile, you have Lavette Mays, who was in a, you know, in some sort of altercation with her mother-in-law, is kept over a year because she can't pay. Mm -hmm. um, it's so because of that inconsistency, um, a lot of advocates, including members of law enforcement, say this is out of whack. Come look at the data, come look at the jail, and you're finding an inordinate amount of people who were not a danger to anybody sitting there. Somebody like Sheriff Tom Dart of Cook County that includes Chicago. He's been in that position for 16 years, a very popular guy. Jails are not for poor people. They're not for people with right. mental illness. This is just not what they're for. They never were for it, but they were being used for that. But in the same sense, we cannot stick our heads in the sand and say, you know what, these people being picked up on gun offenses, uh, that's not a big deal. They'll be fine. No, no. Under Illinois' new law that will take effect in just a couple of weeks, Brad, um, judges will have the discretion on who should be detained. So it's going to be a question now for everyone arrested and charged in the state of uh, Illinois whether uh, they should be out. And the judge can only hold a person if the state shows that the that defendant poses a specific real and present threat to someone else or has a high likelihood of flight. Mm. Or, of course, in the case of forcible felonies, violent felonies like murder, battery, burglary, carjacking, those sorts of things, the judge can hold you, no questions asked. But this is going to be a much more intensive process now where there's going to have to be a bail hearing for each and every one of these defendants to figure out and put it on the judge whether they should stay behind bars. What, that sounds like a fundamental change in like how many people are going to be in jail at any given time awaiting their trial versus how many people are out of jail while they're awaiting their trial. What does that do to a city's, you know, crime rates, law enforcement, all that stuff? Yeah, estimates vary, Brad, as to how many people will actually no longer be in jail at the end of the day, although we can look to states like New York, California, New Jersey that have enacted some pretty significant cash bail reforms and there have been fewer people detained. Most police organizations oppose the legislation, calling it the anti-police bill. Well, there's already rumblings that uh, people are taking a look at at getting out of the profession. On the other hand, you have a lot of law enforcement very leery of the potential impact in Illinois. We are seeing a huge increase in violent crime, gun crimes, um, shootings. It's something we're really concerned about, and we want to still be able to have our, some effective tools that are going to be deterrents. You can't look at C Cook County, which had significantly reduced the use of cash bail uh, five, six years ago. They report a uh, pretty stable level in crime rates in Cook County. Uh, although Sheriff Tom Dart told me that right now they're seeing a slight uptick in people on electric monitoring committing new crimes. You would not believe the amount of guns and drugs we're getting out of the home monitoring houses. But we have seen across the board independent academic studies of, of crime data in places that have reduced the use of cash bail, uh, a pretty balanced and measured response to the change. There hasn't been uh, a significant um, issue of public safety in these places. And that argument, again, has won the day in Illinois. And so the governor there uh, is calling this a big step forward uh, towards the, uh, the disassembly Assembly of systemic racism in his state, uh, and we'll have to see how it plays out. Yeah, and this is one of the stories where you can see like, well-intentioned people coming at this from either side, being like, is this the right way to go? Is this the right way to go? How much of a change do we want here? Uh, Devin Dwyer, really interesting as we look forward to January 1st. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brad. And one last thing. I'll be home for Christmas unless there's a bomb cyclone. It's a twister. It's a twister. In some of the worst holiday timing since the ghost of Christmas future paid a visit to Scrooge, a winter storm is set to barrel across much of the country tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday, which is otherwise known as Christmas Eve. This is going to be the busiest travel time since the pandemic started. Hundreds of thousands of people are flying. Thursday and Friday are the busiest days, and that's when the storm's coming in. That's ABC's Sam Sweeney. He covers transportation and says he's not just nervous for people in cold-weather cities. 
Some experts are calling it a bomb cyclone. It's coming in from the west. It's going to hit the major hubs, Denver, Chicago, then move into the northeast. And once it hits those hubs is when it begins to trickle across the entire country. There is your garden variety cyclogenesis, and then there's your bombogenesis, or a bomb cyclone. And we see those effects on not only Thursday and Friday, but also Saturday and Sunday and into Monday as the airlines try to regroup. What you've got here are concerns of a classic chain reaction. When planes are delayed in Chicago, that can also affect Phoenix. By the time your flight is canceled, it's tough to find another, since most flights this time of year have already sold 95% of their seats. In fact, because airlines are anticipating such big disruptions with little wiggle room, they're actually encouraging passengers to move their Thursday and Friday flights up to today. There are waivers in place from all of the airlines. They are allowing you to change your ticket free of charge, even if there is a fair difference to help mitigate some of these problems. One thing you can do before you show up to the airport, Sam says, is have the airline's app pre-downloaded on your phone. If you see flights getting delayed, you can rebook your ticket quickly instead of calling some call center and waiting to hear everything's taken. Even if you do get to your destination on time, Sam says, there are also questions about Christmas gifts. Some of the biggest cargo shipment hubs in the country are located in Indianapolis, Cincinnati, and Louisville, which are all expecting to become winter wonderlands themselves. But you would never wait until tomorrow to do do your holiday shopping, would you? Hey, someone I want to make sure you know about here. Start Here has been nominated for two Signal Awards, which honor the best podcast of the year. We've been nominated for Best News and Politics Podcast and also for Best Writing for our episode that we called Mother Tongue about the war in Ukraine. And something about the Signal Awards is they actually factor in votes from listeners about the shows that you feel are most deserving. So if I could humbly ask, if you find this show valuable, if you think Start Here is a helpful part of your day, I hope you will consider taking a minute or two to give us your vote. We made this super simple, actually. We posted links to the voting pages in today's episode description. So if you just get your phone out right now, you go to the podcast that you are currently listening to, go to the description, hit that link, and vote. Voting ends tomorrow, so this is not a drill. Do it now if you can. I'm Brad Milkey. Thank you very much for listening. As always, I'll see you tomorrow. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're baby. making magic. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one.